Hello, hopefully you can hear me. Um, we're going to be chatting today in this kind of private Patreons only um, live stream about physics. And we're going to be looking specifically at light and optics. If you ever have any questions as we're going through, go ahead and put those in the chat. I think I've set this up properly so that it should be pretty much immediate. So I should be able to see the chat. You should be able to see kind of what I'm saying without too much of a delay. Um, and we'll kind of just jump in. So uh, we're going to look first at the kind of different properties. Um, and then, hi, once we kind of get some of these different properties down, what we'll look at is predominantly kind of lenses and mirrors. So we're going to be zooming in and sort of focusing in on the idea of refraction and reflection because refraction and reflection are really the properties that underlie lenses and mirrors. And we're going to talk about how they're similar, how they're different, and hopefully make this stuff a little bit easier to kind of understand. We're going to look at some of the applications and the problems um, or sort of how you would use this stuff rather than just focusing on what it is. So first up, we have sort of these like three major properties that we're going to be considering when we're thinking about how light is going to interact with other stuff. We have diffraction, we have refraction and reflection, and they're just going to describe different ways that light is going to interact. So diffraction, the big thing that we have to have for this guy to work is we need to have what's called a thin slit or a small slit. Um, and the light needs to pass through that. And then we're going to get this sort of weird pattern of kind of interference where we get some areas that are bright and some areas that are dark. And that's just because there's this like weird wave property that light has. This is probably one of the least important things that you need to understand for the MCAT. I do think it is worth understanding this material for the MCAT, but I think that I would just know it at the context of what is diffraction okay, it's the light passing through a slit. It's going to create some sort of interference pattern. There's also diffraction grading. Usually the patterns you're going to see come up with diffraction grading is going to have something to do with color. Usually they're going to put in some sort of monochromatic light and you're going to get a rainbow. Think like a CD. So a CD is actually a diffraction grading. So if you ever looked at the bottom of a CD, that CD is kind of rainbowy. That is diffraction. And that's really all we're going to say about diffraction. We're going to be looking a lot more into refraction and reflection because there's a lot more to dig into with these concepts. So refraction is often called bending of light when you pass into a new medium. And that's right. Um, I think a little bit more importantly with refraction is why is it that we're bending? It's because we're slowing down. So for example, if we look at this light here, it's passing into a new medium. We can see this bending. This is actually due to uh, slowing down, which we'll kind of talk about. And then you're going to come out the other side. So that's refraction. And then reflection is bouncing. So again, bending. And then reflection is going to be bouncing. With reflection, it's pretty straightforward. We come in and we have a particular angle to this thing. And when we bounce out, we're actually going to have the exact same angle when we bounce out like this as well. And there's really not much more to reflection other than just knowing that that sort of what they say, the incident angle. So this would be the incident because that's where you hit your incident to something if you hit it from that way. And then this is the reflected angle, uh, angle, just knowing that the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are the same. Um, we're going to look at refraction because usually this is the one that gives people a bit of trouble. And we're going to talk about why the idea of slowing describes bending because I think that this can make refraction a little bit more understandable. And it's also going to make sense as to why we see the types of bending that we see. And we're going to use an analogy to kind of get at this. So we'll zoom in in our first piece once this loads. And we're going to kind of think about a little bit of a silly kind of example here. And we're going to imagine that you're out, um, make sure that's in the right view, that you're out and you're going to go kayaking. And if you've never been kayaking, that's totally okay, because I'll kind of describe what is going on in the situation. But we have this sort of weird setup where we're going to be kayaking in water, we're going to hit a strip of hot fudge, and then we're going to go back into water. We're, and this is going to be kind of an analogy for what we're going to see with our light rays. And we'll transition this over to the light ray. And this will help you understand like why we see the bending that we see. But anyways, I digress. Um, presumably, if you're in water, you're going to travel a little bit faster. And when you hit fudge, you're going to slow down because it's, it's thicker, it's more viscous, it's going to resist your movement a bit. I want to talk about this sort of very special area that we see is this sort of transition zone. So we have two transition zones. We're going to talk about this transition zone right here when we're going from water to fudge. And then we're also going to talk about this transition zone over here when you're going from fudge to water and what's going to kind of happen. And this is essentially going to describe why slowing is going to lead to bending and why speeding up also leads to bending. So if we have this guy and they're traveling in the water. 
And they're going to come here. Let's just think about what happens when the paddles are in this position. So the kayaker is sort of in here and the paddles are in here. We can see this, there's sort of this unique piece where we have this outer paddle that's going to be in water, but then we have this inner paddle that will be in fudge. And so this guy's going to slow down. So we can sort of see this as being like the slow side. But since this is in water, this is still going to be fast. So what's going to happen is this side is going to maybe go this fast, and this is only going to travel this far. And that's going to lead to bending because if this this top side here that we have is going much, much faster, then what we're going to get at the end of the day is essentially one side going faster than the other and rotation like this. So that's why we see bending. So if we were tracing this out and light, which we'll do here, which we're going to look at air and then going to glass, what we would see is this would come in. We'd have our little paddles. This is the fast side. This is the slow side of light. And so we bend like this. And so that's what we would essentially see with our kayaker as well, is they would bend and then they would be traveling through the fudge. And if the whole boat is in fudge, then both sides are going the exact same speed. So that's why we're straight. We're not going to be going faster or slower anymore. But then what's going to happen when we get over to this other side? So let's kind of take this back a little bit. Ooh, uh, go up there. No, I want to leave that. Okay. That's as much as we're going to get in terms of clearing that out. But that's okay. So let's go ahead and look at what we get here. So now we have this person who's going to be coming in bent. Make them bent like that. And now they're going to hit this new interface, and we have those kayak paddles again. And what we're going to see in this case is that this side is now going fast. This side is going slow because it's stuck in the fudge. So we're going to see a slightly different circumstance when we transition from slow to fast um, in terms of how we bend. Right before we were sort of bending down, now we're going to be bending back up. And this is what's essentially going to cause this to be at the same exact angle that we came in. So if we're kind of tracing out the angle that we came in, which we'll do in green, this is sort of what it would look like, which is exactly where we come up. But we've shifted down because in between these two points, we've had some bending that is coming down. And this is why that speeding up versus slowing down matters when we're thinking about light, because it's the speeding up and slowing down that actually causes the bending. So if you're ever sort of confused and trying to figure out which way are we going to bend, you can sort of draw these silly little um, paddles. And it always helps me decide, okay, that's how we end up bending. And so you would be able to draw this out. Let's go ahead and think kind of about the situation, dive into the idea of refraction a little bit more. You can imagine, well, what would happen if we started to replace this fudge, which is a little bit silly, with different things. So for example, let's say that we sort of we uh, put cement. Um, or let's say that we were going to put something that is just a little bit thicker than water. Nothing comes, maybe juice. I don't know, juice. It's so maybe just a little bit thicker. What's going to happen in these different scenarios? Let's just kind of walk through some of these scenarios and think about what would happen. So if we're going from water to juice, if juice isn't quite as thick, there's a little bit of a... Um, there's There was more similarity in between the two sides. So it's more like you're going... Yes, fast and slow. There's still a fast and a slow side, but it's like the fast side is honestly not that much faster than the other side. So we're going to bend less because in this instance, right before, you can see that there was a really big mismatch in the shape or the size of these arrows. But if we were to replace this now just with juice, which is still the slow side, right, this would be going quite a bit faster, so we're going to bend less. And if we were to slip this around and put this into cement, then we could see this be even more extreme. Like maybe this paddle is just getting stuck, and so all we're going to get is bending until we're able to go through this light. And the difference in our analogy here between juice and fudge and cement is what we call the index of refraction. And so what I want to think about is there's this equation that says n, which is the index of refraction, is equal to c. That's the speed of light over v, and this is the velocity of the light um, within that specific medium. So this is like the velocity in the medium. So I want to think about what's the relationship because this can kind of help us kind of consider what is, and anytime we're thinking about a relationship, I want to think about the math here. So when you want to know the relationship between these things, we need to have it so the equal sign is between them, right? So n is equal to, well, we don't really care about the c here because it's constant, it's not going to change. So what this is really telling us is that n 
is going to be inversely proportional to 1 over v. Or said another way is that as the index of refraction goes up, the velocity goes down, which makes a lot of sense because if we were talking about before, right, index of refraction is kind of like a sludge factor. Juice would have a low index of refraction, so the velocity is still pretty high. Cement, on the other hand, would have a really big index of refraction, so the velocity would be much, much slower. And with this, we can also say that as the index of refraction is going up and the velocity is dropping, the amount of bending is also increasing. And that's just kind of hopefully following through what we've already described. Any questions at this point before we kind of move on? Because this stuff's really critical to understand because refraction is really what governs lenses. Um, we're going to look at Snell's law and kind of how it works. We'll look at some examples of how they can ask these problems. We'll just kind of walk through. But I want to make sure that we're clear on everything so far and that we haven't missed any of the important sort of foundation concepts thus far. I don't see anything in the chat, but I'll keep an eye out just to be sure. So we've already kind of described this here. And now let's go ahead and kind of talk about Snell's law. Snell's law is going to just quantify how much bending. So like before we were saying, oh, we could bend a little or we could bend a lot. And that is like great if we want to talk about this stuff in terms of the concepts. But scientists like to often quantify this, especially safe guy glasses. People want to know what are the glasses going to do in terms of altering how the light comes and hits my eyes in order to hopefully fix the vision problems that I have. We need to be able to quantify that because otherwise they'd just be doing guesswork and that's not super great because you could guess a bunch. So something like Snell's Law allows us to essentially put numbers to all of this stuff. And let's just go ahead and think before we kind of jump into actually calculating something out or something along those lines is what's going to happen conceptually with Snell's law and what we're going to see and why this would make sense. So let's say that we're going to take this situation here again. So n equals one, that's the index of refraction here. That's the index of refraction and that's as low as you can go. That's in a vacuum. And then we have an n equals two that's going to be a little bit higher. And then we're going to go back to n equals one. Looks like a two, but it's supposed to be one. So let's just take this first piece here. So this is going to be n, this in blue, um, n one, that's one. And then we have sine theta 1, which we're just going to leave unfined. And then we have n2, that's 2, will be sine theta 2. So let's just kind of think about it. These things are set equal to each other, which means that this whole value here needs to equal this whole value here. And what happens is that when you take the sine of some value, say that you take sine theta of 0, it's just 0. And if you take sine of 30, then it's 0.5. And if you take sine of 45, it's 0.7. And if you take sine of 90, it's 1. So as we increase our theta value, we're also increasing sine theta. So let's just kind of consider what would happen. If we were to increase the index of refraction, we would need to drop this angle, this number, in order for it to be equal because this number is lower, which means that this sine theta must be bigger. This is kind of like the continuity equation, if you're familiar with that, where it's like a1v1 equals a2v2. So if you increase area, we know that that's going to decrease the velocity because it's the only way that those two sides end up being equal. That's the exact same thing that we're going to see over here. And this actually describes why we saw the particular bending pattern that we did. Because this theta 1, or where is this theta on this, right? Because we could say, oh, is this the theta? Is this the theta? Like, how do we draw this theta value? It's called, or it's referenced to what we call a normal. And that brings us to, well, what is a normal? Because that's important to understand. Let's just think about normal force. Because I think normal forces are a little bit easier to kind of conceptualize. And I know we're kind of jumping between topics here, but hopefully it kind of brings it all together. What is a normal? A normal is just perpendicular to some surface, and that's where we would say the normal force comes from. So when we have a box and it's pushing down with some force of gravity, we say that the normal force just pushes straight up against it. And that's just because the normal force is 90 degrees to the surface. But that's why we can't just say, oh, right, force of gravity is straight down. The normal force is, in this instance, these things are equal, because if this is in equilibrium, that's what we'd see. But that's why when we have things on an inclined plane, we have to begin to consider these other forces, the force perpendicular and the force parallel. And the force perpendicular is what tells us the normal force, because that is what is 90 degrees to the normal. So if we bring that concept over here, where is our normal? Well, it's just 90 degrees to some surface. So if we're looking at the surface of our lens and we're going to draw this normal, then that right there is your normal because it's 90 degrees to the surface. So normals are kind of a general concept that apply across multiple different concepts. So hopefully that kind of ties everything together a little bit more. And then if we're looking at this, right, we were talking about how the angle would need to be decreasing. You're always just going to look for the smallest angle. So for example, we could draw 
the normal like this. And you could think about, oh, well, this could be the theta one, but this would be wrong because we're looking for the smallest angle that we can draw to the normal. And that would be pretty big. Instead, what we would wanna draw is this guy here. That is theta one. And then if we look at theta two, what's the smallest angle we can draw? It's this guy here. And what you can see is that, yep, sure enough, theta one is definitely bigger and theta two is definitely smaller. So it kind of describes what we were seeing before is that when we come in and we're thinking about how we put the fast and the slow here, it's basically saying we need to bend towards the normal. And that's exactly what we saw because this side is fast, this side is slow, we bent towards the normal, we decreased that particular angle. So this is more of a conceptual look at what Snell's law is sort of telling us. So before we kind of think about what's going to happen or like put it, everything into this equation, we're going from n equals 2 to n equals 1. So we're sort of flipping this around. We can think, okay, well, if we increase and we go from 1 to 2, we know that our angle is going to drop. So then if we go from 2 to 1, as in we're transitioning from here to here, then our angle must increase. And that's exactly what we see in this case as well. And again, we could describe this on the same way that we had previously, but it's kind of the same concept. So this is now our theta one, and we can see that theta two did in fact get bigger. So this is kind of just showing you how this is a lot like continuity in terms of how you solve it. And I've seen them ask questions like this. So hopefully that kind of helps with um, refraction outside of the context of lenses, because this is pretty much all there is to this. You can, of course, just throw the numbers in and solve for everything out. They could ask for that. If they did ask for that, I imagine they would give you the sign values. It's possible that they didn't. You would need to have them memorized. Um, but I suspect that they probably, the AMC would ask it without needing that because it's not necessarily a math test of, a test of memorization of like, oh, the sign of 30 is 0.5. Um, not a bad idea to have those things memorized just in case. But hopefully this is kind of helpful in terms of clarifying um, what we're dealing with when it comes to the idea of refraction. So just to kind of summarize before we move on really quickly to look at lenses, right? So we're dealing with refraction, the bending of light. This has to do more with the slowing and speeding down. And we kind of described how that is determined by the index of refraction and the fact that we have this inverse relationship. So as our N goes up, our V is going to drop. We used our analogy, but it also applies to light. And we sort of hopefully have seen how Snell's law sort of ties into this. It just gives us a way to quantify what we've been seeing before. But we can see that the concepts really do apply. And then we also kind of discuss this idea of a normal. And a normal is something that is a general concept in physics that happens to come up here. And you're always going to be thinking about 90 degrees to some particular um, surface. So whether it's a normal force, it's 90 degrees to the surface it's sitting on, or if it's in Snell's law and we're talking about the normal as an angle, it's 90 degrees to the surface of that lens. I know that always gave me trouble when I was actually taking the physics class and it didn't quite click until I kind of realized that this was a concept. So hopefully that's helpful. Any questions on refraction um, at this point in time at all? I'm just kind of keep an eye on the chat if there are questions. Um, as I just kind of get this next slide sort of set up. All right, so what we'll do now is begin to take this information that we had about refraction and take it and start to apply it to lenses. And we'll bring in ideas of reflection as well. So what I wanna do, so we're gonna zoom out first and kind of just look at this overall is I wanna highlight a couple of things. So we're gonna be looking at this from several different viewpoints. We're gonna look at some things that are sort of universally true. So these are gonna hold whether you're converging or diverging, whether you're a lens or a mirror. We're also gonna look at the type of system you are. So these are gonna be things that are gonna hold true regardless of whether or not you're a lens or a mirror and you're gonna be looking at converging and diverging. And then we'll talk about the things that are true if you're a lens versus a mirror. And what is a little bit different than what you might've learned is that typically, this is our focus, right? We are very focused on the differences and the similarities between lenses and mirrors, but I actually think that's the least important thing. What I think is a little bit more important is understanding what applies in general, and then also beginning to say, okay, what implies to converging systems? What implies to diverging systems? Because realistically, the only difference between lenses and mirrors is just reflection versus refraction. But in terms of the images that they form and how we apply a lot of those thin lens concepts, or I guess mirror concepts, it's actually all the same. So we're gonna kind of break this down. We're gonna start with the things that are sort of universally true that you can apply to lenses and mirrors. And this is gonna be dealing with the equations predominantly, but we're also gonna talk about the types of images that can be formed. So things that are universally true. 
Um, thin lens formula, even though it says has like lens in the name, it's universally true. It's also true for mirrors. So this is just where you have one over F is equal to one over O plus one over I. These are just referring to the distance. So like how long is the focal length? Where is the object place? Where does the image form in terms of distance? Magnification is also true for all of these systems that we're going to describe. And that's going to be um, M is equal to negative I over O, which is the distance of these two things, but it could also be equal to the height of the image over the height of the object. So you could imagine that you have an image that is five centimeters tall and an object that was only one centimeters tall. Well, that's times five magnification because it took some object and it made it five times taller. Um, and this is kind of interesting because it means that the image distance has a lot to do with how tall that thing is going to be relative to the object distance, which is to me a little bit interesting. The other thing that is also universally true is going to be how the radius of curvature, which is R. So if we're looking at a lens, you can imagine that maybe this is your lens, but it's just made out of a you know circle, but we just took like a slice of it. This would be its radius. We can relate this to the focal length. So the focal length is sort of like, yeah, it's here. It's not perfect, um, but it's kind of good enough. So there's this relationship, and this is going to be true regardless of whether or not you're a lens or you're a mirror or you're converging or diverging. All of this is the same. This is the same exact relationship that will always hold true. Um, the other thing that's going to be true is image. If you are a certain type of image, you will always have a certain type of configuration. So if you are a bright, which is what we're looking at here, then you're always going to be a virtual image. And if you're upside down, which is what we see here, or sometimes you'll hear people say that it's inverted, then this is always going to be a real image. So we never, ever, ever have an upright real image. It just doesn't exist. We cannot do that. We will only ever have upright and virtual images, and we'll only ever have inverted and real images. And this is just always going to be true. It doesn't matter if you're a mirror. It doesn't matter if you're a lens. And this now is going to bring us to this distinction that we're going to start to look at between converging and diverging systems. And I say systems because lenses can converge things, but so can mirrors. And diverging lenses can also occur, but we can also have diverging mirrors. And there are some things that are always true of these converging and diverging systems, regardless of whether or not you're a mirror or you're a lens. The only difference is how we produce that particular result. So if you're converging, the object placement is going to matter in terms of what image we form. We can't just say that there's always going to be one particular situation. But the thing that will always be true is that the light will, um, generally speaking, in most circumstances, converge to a particular point in time. Not always true, which is what makes them a little bit wonky. And that's why we say the object placement matters. But in general, if you put some straight, just horizontal light into this system, so for example, we're just going to put some horizontal light into this system. It is going to come out at the focal length. And if we were to put some just straight horizontal light into this system, it would also come out at the focal length. So this is really what we're talking about as being similar. The fact that we get, if you put this straight horizontal light and you get this convergence, we're not talking about the shapes being similar. We're not talking about even the side of where the light is going to be at being similar because that is going to be a focus of what is happening. And you can notice that there is actually going to be a shape difference between these two. I always just tell people that if you're thinking about converging systems and you're looking at the difference between lens and mirrors, they should never be the same shape because they are different properties. Like they are coming about from different properties. We'll talk about how we can kind of keep these straight here in a sec, but let's look at the diverging systems now. For diverging, on the other hand, right, if we have some straight light that comes in like this, when it comes out, it's going to appear as though it originates from this focal length over here. It, it can't actually, you know, go to the focal length because it's diverging. It's going to cause them to go apart. But when we're talking about diverging lenses, we're talking about this appearance of seeming to come from this area. And the same thing would be true for this mirror as well. So the light would be bouncing out. And if we were to trace this back, eh, close enough, um, it would appear as though it has come from this here. And again, this is going to be always true. The other thing that's true and that's kind of nice about these diverging systems is that they're always going to produce reduced or smaller virtual images. So if you had some object in here and you're wondering what image will it create and it's a diverging system, it's always going to be virtual. And the other thing is that they're always going to be smaller. A diverging system will never, ever, ever produce larger images. And if you've ever volunteered in a hospital or maybe you've worked in a hospital, if you've ever sort of seen the mirrors that they have to help you see around corners so that there isn't like a collision of patients in their beds. There are mirrors that are shaped like this. 
And one of the things that's weird about them is if you look in this mirror, everything looks really, really tiny. Like you can see the whole area, but everything looks super, super tiny. This is a diverging example. That's an example of a diverging mirror. So hopefully that can kind of help you keep it straight. So then what about shapes? It can be kind of easy to get the shapes confused, right? We have convex and we have concave you know, what's what. So I always think about vexed means angry. So you can see that this is like an angry lens. So if you can draw a face in the lens then or the mirror, then that's your convex. So for example, there's our angry face right there. So that is a convex lens. And then here's our other angry face. So that is also a convex mirror. You kind of have to like draw this out to produce that backside. And then for concave, I think, oh, well, bats are in caves. So if there are bats in caves, then there has to be a cave for the bat to be in. And that's exactly what you can see here. So if you have a space to put your bat, which it'd be really hard, like where do you put your bat? It's all kind of like bowing out. There's no cave for them to live in. Then you have a concave system. And you can see that there are these two discrepancies. So what I always tell people is I say, memorize the lenses, memorize this guy, memorize this shape. And then just remember that this is the opposite shape when you're dealing with the mirror. So that is the opposite shape. Any questions about the more kind of conceptual pieces at all? Oh, and I forgot to mention this. These also have a negative focal length. So always, 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 whatever value you see, you always want to slap a negative sign if it's a diverging system. Other than that, the sign conventions are pretty straightforward and I'm not really going to go over much of them except for this guy here because it's the most, most important one. Okay, cool. I do not see any questions on this, so we'll go ahead and move on. And now we're going to start to look at, so previously, what I had said was that the, it's a random image there. Um, cool. So previously, what I said is that object placement mattered for a converging system. And this is true. So I want to talk about this and what that means and what we're going to begin to see, because where we place our object is going to change the size of the image. It's not like the diverging system where it's always smaller. And it's also going to change the image, which is kind of weird. Um, so we can have virtual images, we can have real images, we can have smaller images, we can have larger images, we can have images that are the same size. And we're going to focus on just two major important points. We're going to look at f, the focal length, and we're going to look at 2f, two times the focal length. And I don't, you might see out there, there are all these like giant charts that talk about if you're inside f, if you're at f, if you're between 2f and f, if you're outside of 2f, you can memorize that if you'd really like. But I personally think that this is much easier. We're going to think about this as two important transition points. So as long as we understand what happens at these two transition points, you can work out what's going to happen. So f is your image transition, which means that this is the spot where you transition between different types of images. If you are inside F, so if you're in this space here, then you are going to end up being virtual. However, if you are in this space over here, so you're outside of F, then you're gonna be real. And since there's no in-between, right? There's no in-between between a real and a virtual image, you just get no image at F because this is like the transition point. So we just have to ask ourselves, what's a transitional image? That's not a thing, so we don't get an image. Well, what about size? So for size, on the other hand, do this in yellow, um, as you get closer to objects, they appear larger. So if you're inside 2F, then you're going to be bigger. You're going to be a larger image. And if you're outside of 2F, then as you as image gets farther away from us, then they're going to be smaller. And here's the thing that's different. Unlike the image having no transition point, well, size transitions can happen. Like what is between smaller and bigger? It's the same size. So if you are right at 2F, you will end up being the same size. So for example, if we had an object, let's say that we put this object here, right at 2F, and we want to know what sort of image would this end up form? Well, it's going to form a real image because it's outside of F. So we can say, okay, this is real. Remember, they're always inverted. And if we want to know how tall would this be, let's say that we just pick some number, we're just gonna say that this is a two meter tall object, then the image would also be two meters tall because they have the exact same size. And if we think about that magnification before, we said that the height and the distance are essentially just directly related. If this is at 2F, then it turns out that this guy over here is also going to form at 2F because if you're the same size or the same height, then you must be the same distance away as well. 
So it kind of fits together. And this is kind of the easiest way that I found to learn these concepts. How do we use this, right? How do we use this? Because this is great to have memorized, but what do we do with this information? One of the things that I like to do is if they give me some information, they're asking about heights. So let's just say that we had some answer choices. It's like A, B, C, and D. And we'll put our right answer here. This will be two meters. We'll put our wrong answer here, four meters. We'll say this is one meter and 0 0.5 meters. If I look at this and I say, hey, we're at um, 2F, then I look at these answer choices here. I'm like, oh, well, we have to be the same size. So that's actually really easy. Cool. But if they had moved this and they said, okay, actually what you're going to see instead, and we'll put this guy in red, is you're going to get the object placement here. I'd be like, okay, the object placement is inside 2F. So I'm going to be looking for something that is bigger than two meters. Cool. D is my answer. I don't need to do any additional work. But what if they put it outside, right? So they're going to put it here. It's outside of 2F. We know that it's smaller. So I'm like, okay, it's smaller. So I'm at a 50-50. And now I could actually go through and do the math to figure the answer out. But if I'm short on time, no big deal. I'm at 50-50. Maybe I just pick an answer that sounds good. I'll flag it and I'll come back. And if I happen to have time, then I can go ahead and go through and solve this problem. But hey, a 50-50 guess and having time for a problem that you're 100% sure that you can solve is better than just guessing from all four answer choices and spending a bunch of time on this and not being able to get to problems down the line. So this is one of the ways that I like to have my students use this information um, because it's great to have the information, but what we do with it was what's really, really important for the MCAT. Any other questions about the concept here? Otherwise, what we'll move on is we'll look at some um, further examples, and we're going to kind of talk about what are some potential answer choices that would actually make sense here. Okay, cool. So now we'll go ahead and look, and we're going to look at some of these different situations, and we're going to think about what are possible answer choices. So we're going to think about it in terms of two different contexts. We'll think about possible answer choices in terms of height. We'll think about possible answer choices in terms of type of image formed, and we're going to just kind of leave it there. So in this first one here, this is a concave, right, because we could draw a bat, and it's a lens, so it's diverging. And diverging systems are always going to produce a particular type of image. They're going to produce always virtual images. And these will, images will always be smaller than the object. So whatever the um, height of the object is, that will always have to be greater than the height of the image. OK, then what about this one here? So OK, we're inside of F, so this is also going to be virtual. And then we know that as objects get closer to a converging lens, they get larger. So it would have to be larger. So if we're thinking about this guy here, we know that the height of the object would have to be smaller than the height of the image. And we can do the same thing for this one here. The only thing that's going to change is now we're on the other side, so we're going to get a real image because we're outside of F. It's still closer than 2F because this is the size transition point. So any answer choices would have to be larger. And again, the height of the object would have to be smaller than the height of the image. And this will constrain the possible answer choices that we could pick. And that's how you could make some eliminations on the basis of these different things, so long as you kind of have this information memorized. OK, but what if we do actually need to do the calculation? How do we go about calculating it, whether it's a mirror or it's a um, lens. We'll look at the diverging system first, and we're going to use a lens as an example. And this is basically just the usage of the thin lens formula, but I also want to show you how the AMC, which they will do, can stack the thin lens formula with the magnification formula. So let's just write out our formulas so that we're clear on them. So we have 1 over f is equal to 1 over i plus 1 over o, and then we have magnification is equal to negative. The negative is just a flip um, it for the fact to say that like the image is either upright or inverted, which we can look at here. And this is also equal to height of the image over the height of the object. So let's say that we have this here. And the first thing that they want to know or they want us to solve for is where will the image show up in all of this? So we can begin to restrain um, what we would expect with this. So we have a focal length. This is going to be the focal length is five centimeters. And we have an image that's 20 centimeters. So if I'm thinking about where will this object show up, the things that I would be thinking about is, well, it's going to be a real image and real images form over here. So they're not going to form on the same side for 
um, oh wait, sorry, it's diverging. Um, they're going to form on this side, and these are going to be virtual. Thinking of this as a converging lens. It is a diverging lens. There we go. Perfect. Um, and we know that it has to be smaller because it is a diverging lens. So if there were some answer choices that we could eliminate on the basis of that, great. If not, then we're going to just have to do the math. The math is pretty straightforward. Here's the nice thing. So long as everything is in the same unit, so centimeters or meters or millimeters or whatever, you don't need to change anything. You can just begin to plug this in. So we say, okay, one over F, that's five. So one over five, but it's a diverging lens, so it's gotta be negative. So this is one over negative five. That's the one thing that you've gotta be careful about with the diverging lens, is that your F is always negative. That's just a convention. And then this would be equal to one over I, that's gonna be the thing we're solving for. And then object is 20. You just need to get these into the same units. So as I sort of look at this math here, I'm saying, well, 20 and 5, if I multiply this by 4, so we could say times 4 and times 4, now it'll be over 20 because you need the same denominator because we're basically just going to be doing some fraction, um, subtraction, and addition. So then what we'd have is if we condense this sort of in a couple of steps, so that's first, and then we're going to bring this 1 20th over to this side. This is 1 over i. If we condense this whole side, that's a negative 4 divided by 20 minus 1 over 20. It's kind of like adding them, but we're going to keep the negative. It's negative 5 over 20 is equal to 1 over i. And the easiest thing when you get to this point in time is, yes, you could cross multiply. Just flip both sides. So we just flip both sides. So i is equal to, let's see, negative 20 over 5 or 20 over negative 5 is negative 4. So the image will form at negative 4. Now that sounds a little bit weird, like where the heck is negative 4 centimeters? That's just indicating like, hey, put it over here, which we already kind of knew from this. So we'd say, okay, we could just march this out. Um, if that's our focal length, then it must be forming sort of here at 4 centimeters away. Cool. So that's how you would solve for the actual image position. But what if they wanted to know the height? How would we do that? So there are a couple things. So the first thing that we could say... Um, let's put this guy in yellow, All right. is that since we have a diverging system, if you had some answer choices and it's going to say how big was the image, well, we already know that the possible or the potential answer choice has to be less than 10 centimeters for the height of this particular image because, right, it's diverging. It makes things smaller. If you want to bridge and you actually need to calculate it out, like that's not going to cut it, which can happen sometimes, then how would that work? It's actually pretty straightforward. A lot of people are pretty good with this step here, but then they get really, really stuck when you're asked to sort of bridge the gap over to this side, right? So we're pretty good with this usually. How do we bridge it over to here? Well, what did we solve for, right? What did we solve for? We solved for the image, which is at negative four centimeters. And we also have the object distance, which was at 20 centimeters. And we have the height of the object that's at 10 centimeters. And we want to know what is the height of the image. Well, let's just look at our magnification. Huh, that is just this guy here and we're missing one component. So all you really need to do is essentially just plug all these numbers in and you'll be able to solve for the height. Now, sometimes what the AMC will do is they won't put in numbers. They'll just have variables. And if they have variables, just put a number in, just pick something nice and easy to work with. Call it one, right? So say that they didn't give you F, choose F to be one, and then just work that all the way out. And when you get to your answer choices and they're still showing you F in there, just plug one into F and then you can do that math. It's usually much, much easier. But in this case, we kind of have everything. So we'll just go ahead and plug it in. So we said that's I or negative I in this case, um, that'd be four over O 20 is equal to the height of the image, that's what we're solving for, x over 10. So just to start, we'll go ahead and just bring this 10 over. I really like to wait. I'm a, I'm a big fan of waiting to do any sort of division until I have um, kind of the all the math done or like I guess set up. And the reason for that is I really love to cancel stuff out. I think it just makes my life a little bit easier. Because as you can see here, I just canceled the zero on the top and the bottom, and this now just becomes four over two. So what is X equal to? What is the height of this particular image? It is going to be two centimeters tall, which fits with what we had said, right? We said that if the height was 10 centimeters, it should definitely be smaller, and that's exactly what we see. So the math will also work out in terms of solving it. Any questions about this? We're going to look at another example, but we're going to flip this around. We're going to look at a converging system, but this time we're going to look at a converging mirror. We're going to use the exact same setup. Nothing is going to change. We're going to use thin lens formula. Um, even though this is not a lens, it will work just the same.
okay, cool. So now here, the thing that's a little bit different is we're actually going to be given the image. So we're not given the object. We're going to be working backwards and we want to figure out some information about the object overall. So slightly different setup in this case. Um, this is going to be 0 0.3 meters away from this mirror. So in this case, we have F, we have the image, and let's go ahead and just sort of work backwards in terms of what this image is going to tell us. So a couple things, right? We know that it's real. So this is a real image. Since this is a real image, what we know is that if this is F here, this object, wherever it has to be placed, it has to be outside of this. So it has to be somewhere in this vicinity because if this was a virtual image, then we then, or sorry, since this is a real image, it can't be placed inside because we know that in this area, inside F, it is a virtual image. So that could potentially constrain some particular answer choices. For example, if there was an answer choice that said the object will be at 0.1 meters, nope, that's going to be wrong because that just would not lead to this particular setup that we would see here. Um, this is a little bit different in terms of where it forms because we don't ever get images forming over here on a converging mirror, which is what we would expect for a lens, but just focus on whether this is upright or upside down and use that to figure out your image. So now it's just a matter of sort of plugging everything in. So we'll have one over F. So one over F, since this is a converging system, it's gonna be positive. So that's 0.2. We'll be equal to one over I, that's 0.3, plus one over O, and that's what we're solving for in this case here. It's the exact same thing with the math. We just need to find a common denominator. In this case, I'd probably just multiply this guy by three over three and this guy by two over two. That way we get things in terms of 0.6. Don't worry that there's that decimal down there until you actually need to care. So we won't care about this decimal being a little bit goofy until it actually matters. It doesn't really matter right now because so long as you can get into the same denominator, we can worry about having to do decimal math at a later point in time. And it may not even matter. That's what we're going to see here. So this would be 3 over 0.6 minus 2 over 0.6 will be equal to 1 over O. That's 1 over 0.6 is equal to 1 over O. We flip both sides. So in this case, O is equal to 0 0.6 meters. And that fits with our prediction because as we said, we said that the object needs to be outside 0.2. And it is out point, outside point two. But now let's use this information to see if we can make a prediction about what we expect this object to have. So 2f would be 0 0.4. And we know that the object is out over here. What does this tell us? Well, if this is the size transition spot, and we know that as we get closer, objects appear bigger, that as we go to this side, that objects must be smaller. So again, if we were given some answer choices and we said, hey, the image is going to be 0 0.05 meters, we know that this value is smaller than the object because the image, when we put things outside of 2f, is going to be smaller than the object. And that's essentially what we would get to. But then again, we could just solve this out and we'll kind of get everything. So let's just kind of collect all of our values. So our image in this case was at 0.3. So i is equal to 0 0.3 meters. O is equal to... 0 0.6 meters. Uh, the height of I is equal to 0 0.05 meters. And then the height of O is what we're solving for. And we'll just plug it in just like we did before. You can kind of ignore that negative sign if you really want. The only thing that that negative sign is telling you is just saying, hey, this magnification flipped the image downwards and now it's pointing down. That negative in magnification is just telling you that it's inverted. If you already know that it's inverted, then you can kind of ignore that negative sign. Um, I'm going to ignore that negative sign for right now just because I don't really want to deal with it in terms of the math. And you're free to do that. So we said it's image. So image 0 0.3 over object, cool, 0 0.6 will be equal to image 0 0.05 over object. And we're going to be solving for the height of the object. And again, we'll just go ahead and bring this guy over this side just by division. So this would be dividing by both sides, 0 0.05. That's what we'd end up with. Now, I look at this math and I go, yuck, that's gross. Don't really want to do it. And that's reasonable. And so I want to talk really quickly about how we can sort of change this math to make it a little bit easier on ourselves. There are always going to be a couple things that we think about. We think about what are my answer choices? We don't have answer choices here, so we're not going to talk about that. And then we can also think about when it comes to decimals um, and division, 
can I cancel? I always ask myself first, can I cancel? And I can, right? All you're going to begin to think about is can I find a like factor on top and bottom? So for example, we could write this math out as 0 0.3, 0 0.05 times 2 times 0 0.3. Because if we take 2 times 0.3, that's just 0.6. So that's super helpful because now what I'll be left with is... 0.05 times two, and personally, I think that's much easier to deal with than what we had before. This is one over all of that is one over HO. At this point, we can probably flip it, and so we would say that HO will be equal to 0.05 times two. Okay, so now we have some multiplication by division. What I want you to do is I want you to just ignore all of the decimals, so just pretend that they exist. We're gonna just make this as easy as possible. We're gonna turn this into five times two. That's easy, that's 10. And now all I want you to think about at this point in time is how many decimals did I kind of remove when I did this? I moved one, two. So I removed two decimals, so I need to add those back in. So one, two, so this answer is 0.1. You know, this is not so bad in terms of the math here dealing with decimals, but that's just kind of an example of how this would work with this guy here. And again, this fits our sort of overall idea of what we had, right? We said that this object needed to be larger, and in fact it is, right? We started with an image that was 0 0.05 meters, and the object is 0.1 meters, so it is bigger. So hopefully this has been helpful in kind of seeing how the concepts will back up the actual math that we do. I apologize, this slide as an overview is a little bit messy, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the two-step types of thin lens problems that they can ask. It shouldn't really get more complicated than this on your actual exam, um, but you can begin to essentially just think about the transition points, um, at those different pieces, restricting your answer choices, and then if you need to, actually going and doing the math. Any questions as we begin to look through these concepts? Otherwise, I just have one more thing that I want to chat about, and then I'll open it up to see if people have any specific questions. Okay, cool. So I don't see any questions. So the last thing that I want to round this out with is just a discussion of our eyes and what's going on with our eyes. And we're going to talk about corrective lenses. And I like to think about this conceptually because I just think it's a lot easier if we do it this way. So normal vision, how is everything supposed to work? So we have a lens and that's supposed to take some object that's out in the world, bend the light such that it hits the back of our retina. So if we're labeling this here, this is the object distance. This should be, so the lens to retina distance should be your eye. This is like, should be the eye. Might not always be, but this should be the eye. And then there's some focal length and they don't usually ask questions about the focal length, but you could imagine that there is a focal length. It's right there. Um, this is what happens if you have normal vision, but not everybody has normal vision like me. Things end up being blurry and there are two major things that the MCAT wants you to know. They want you to know about people who are nearsighted and the people that are farsighted. And we're gonna use the names here to help us remember what is the problem in each of these situations. So if you're nearsighted, then what I want you to think about is that your image is forming too near, right? Because it's too near to the lens. It should have been all the way back to the retina, but it's not. And in farsighted, the problem is that you're too far away from the retina where you were supposed to form. And now I want to phrase this in terms of an issue with either convergence or divergence in terms of an excess of one or the other. So let's see, if you came here, we would say, oh, well, that's like too much convergence. Right? So you converged too much. You were not supposed to come down at such a um, harsh angle, you should have come out like this, and that's an issue of converging too much. Or you could have said it didn't diverge enough. Um, if we come down to this far-sighted one, right, it formed too far away, so this is like saying too little convergence, because you should have converged more, right? So we should have converged like this, but we didn't, so this image ended up being too far back. So let's just think about this. If you have too much convergence, what type of lens do we do to fix this? Oh, well, shouldn't a diverging lens help correct for the fact that we had too much convergence? So the way that we fix myopia or nearsightedness or having this image form too near is we put a diverging lens out front of this person's eye so that the light is actually going to get pre-diverged. And then when it comes in, it's going to help correct that piece and it's going to be right where it should be. And then if we have too little convergence, then how do we fix this? We just slap a converging lens out front. 
And so that's going to help bring this light in slightly pre-converged so that instead of going too far, we are going to converge a little bit ahead of time and end up right where we should. This was all I ended up having prepared. Hopefully that covered the topics that you really wanted to see. Um, at this point in time, I want to go ahead and open it up. We have about 10 minutes left. See if people have any additional questions, if they want to just put them in the chat. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about this material on optics. Just get to a kind of a blank area so that I can describe stuff and write as we see questions come in. And if there are any questions, that is also totally cool. Um, but I'll hang out here and um, just see, because I know it can take a little bit to type sometimes. Yeah, I'm glad to help. Glad to help. Hopefully that kind of clarified the things that you were really looking for, and hopefully it makes optics a little bit less intimidating. Because I know it can be a topic that gives people a lot of trouble. Any questions at all? I don't think there are any questions. Um, if I'm wrong, do let me know. Um, but no? OK, perfect. Great, yeah, so hopefully that was helpful. That is all I have for today. If any questions do pop up, you can just drop them in the messages at a later time. Um, but other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I know your MCAT is coming up soon, so good luck with your test, but um, hopefully this was helpful. Yeah, and bye.